love that. That makes it officially Christmas season, right? When we've heard Stephen do a fabulous Christmas carol on the organ, we're there. Good morning. It's so good to have you here this morning on this first Sunday of Advent. Whether you're worshiping with us in person or online, we're so thankful you're here. And it's really wonderful to think that your presence in this service has already been prayed over. Isn't that amazing? The Holy Spirit's already working. I'm so very, very thankful that you decided to join us today. Um, directions for our worship service are on the back. You probably already know it, but if you have not been vaccinated uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine and provided proof of that, then you are required to wear a mask. If you have provided that proof, it's up to you. Um, we just want to keep our family safe. Remember that during the service, we'd love to have you fill out a card with updated address and email so that we know how to get important information to you, know how to get a hold of you. So any questions you might have hopefully are answered on the back of that. But it's just wonderful to have you here. And we see glimpses of Christmas coming up everywhere. I hope your Thanksgiving was wonderful and you had time with chosen family and biological family and everything else just to enjoy the presence of each other and the presence of our God as we thank him for all of his bounty. Let's stand together this morning. We're going to sing our first hymn together, 123 in your hymnal. If you want to hold a hymnal or the words will be up on the screens too. Let's welcome in this holiday season.
encourage you, please stay standing as we recite our words of witness that are in your bulletin or up on the screen if you don't know them. Let's say together. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, goodness, and love, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord and Savior, who for us and our salvation lived and died and rose again and lives evermore and in the Holy Spirit who takes the things of Christ and reveals them to us, renewing, comforting, and inspiring our souls. We are united in striving to know the will of God as taught in the Holy Scriptures and in our purpose to walk in the ways of the Lord made known or to be made known to us. Before you're seated, take a minute to wave to those people around you, wave to our folks at home online, say hello. Together with Christians around the world, we light the first candle of Advent the candle of hope. As we light this first candle, we prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In Romans 15, 13, Paul writes, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope. Today we celebrate our hope in Christ, the light of the world. Let us all pray together. Lord, as we look forward to the birth of Jesus, Help us to bring your light to the lives of those around us. Prepare our hearts for the joy and gladness of your coming. May we find hope in Christ. Amen. Thank you, Moena's family. What a gift you are to our church. Thank you for all that you provide for us with your talent and with your spirit. We have lots of things going on at our church, as you can see. Plans for Christmas Eve are forthcoming, so keep an ear and an eye open for those. We will be having in-person service, and we'll let you more know more about that um, as it's all figured out and revealed. <laughs> the Women's Fellowship is gathering $5 gift cards to fast food restaurants around town that we can give to Youth Hope. Our church is um, a, a great supporter of Youth Hope, a really wonderful group here in our town that's taking care of uh, teens and their families. So if you um, can just purchase some $5 gift cards and bring those here to church, the Women's Fellowship would appreciate that. Two weeks from today, on the 12th of December, is our um, Lessons and Carols here, so there's lots of music in our service, but if you're interested, there's also 
a kids' Christmas pageant at Restoration Church at 9.15 that morning. Our Clarion kids will be singing for us in the holiday season virtually, but if you want to go and see something live, uh, Restoration's kids are doing that at 9.15, and we hear them below us rehearsing every Sunday while we're rehearsing in the, in the chapel, and it's just wonderful to hear their voices singing all of those. So that's two weeks from today, the 12th of December at uh, 9.15. And I just want to give a shout out, first of all, to our Deacons Board and Women's Fellowship um, and, and uh, who helped to put up our crash over the last several weeks, to Julie and Ben and Nick Michaels, and to Ben and Shirley for putting up what is here today, and our tree angels, Joyce and Julie Cutler and Jen Smith are yet to come, and it's just exciting um, to watch the, the church kind of come together as we prepare for uh, Christmas. It's such a gift to us. And Julie, I think you have an announcement also. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Julie Michaels. I serve as moderator for 2021. On Sunday, November 14th, our church held an all-congregational special meeting in response to a petition that was presented to the moderator. Members had time through November 22nd to vote, and votes were tabulated on the 23rd. Those participating in the vote tabulation and verification were Neil Weiner, Debbie Pretzman, John Mills, John Barry, and me. As I shared during our meeting uh, on the 14th, this petition did not ask for an action, an action to change our Constitution, our bylaws, our policies and procedures, our website, or any church document. The only purpose was to provide information and guidance to our pastoral search committee, as well as our leadership team as our church moves forward. So I share with you the results from that day. The results are as follows. 283 individual ballots were sent out. 196 were returned, which represents a 69% return rate. This large return rate shows the commitment that members have for the well-being of our church. Of the 196 ballots, four of them did not have a name on the outside of the envelope, so they were never opened. One had a name, but did not mark a vote. That being said, this one ballot had comments, therefore we did not count the ballot in the actual count, but we did scan the comments. This brought the total down to 191 actual votes. Of the 191 ballots, I apologize, 190, 190 actual votes. Of the 190 ballots, 64 were marked in support of the statement, which represents a 33.7%, and 31 of those ballots had comments. One hundred twenty-six ballots were marked to not support the statement in the petition, which represents 66.3%, and 81 of those had comments. The leadership team will be reviewing all the comments. In summary, when nearly 70% of the congregation voted, and nearly 70% of the voted, voters voted one way, we do have a majority consensus on this issue. So what happens next? I will be drafting a letter that goes out to all of our members so that everyone has the same information. The leadership team will offer to meet with the original petitioners once again. This information has been shared with Joe Vreeman, the chair of our search committee, so that the committee, our search firm, and our candidates can be aware of the outcome. But what can happen immediately as a church congregation? This vote has confirmed for all of us here at FCC that we are a diverse church. We are a welcoming and loving church. There is room at our church for differences of opinion because we're all, we are all united in striving to know the will of God and united in Christ, our words of witness and our statement of faith. Discovering what God wants for me individually in my life is going to be a lifelong journey and I need you to walk with me. In addition, I want to walk with you because you are on your own journey. As, as individually and as a church, we strive to know that will of God in our lives and for our church. Today we begin the season of Advent, 
the anticipation of Christ's birth, let us also begin a time of love, a time of healing, and a time of forgiveness. And during this season and always, please share the good news of Christ with all. Let everyone know that Redlands First Congregational Church welcomes them to worship with us. Thank you. We are definitely a family, uh, a family in the body of Christ. And while everyone in this church is special, you know, one of the pieces I love about church is um, our music. Our music is so beautiful, whether it's special music or our anthems. And there is uh, a person who pulls together that music for us. It also happens to be the day that God placed this person on earth. It is Bruce McClurg's birthday today. So we're going to join and sing happy birthday. Happy birthday, Bruce. And now let us continue with some of that special music that Bruce, Stephen, the quartet, and our special guest musician, Becky Long, have put together for us this morning. Oh 
This is the time in our service we would usually take the offering. We encourage you to continue giving as we continue to support this church and causes that are important to this church and our community. You can do that by going online, by putting your offerings in the basket at the back, by mailing them to the churches, lots of ways. And we thank you in advance for uh, helping keep this place alive and keep ministering to our community. Let's pray together. Oh, gracious God, how exciting and heartwarming it is to enter this season of Advent, to join with other believers and anticipate Christmas, the great celebration of the birth of our Savior. We are thankful all year, but especially now, that you sent your precious Son to this earth. We recognize our need for a Savior today more than ever. We seek healing, Lord, healing in our world, in our great country, within our families, and right here in our congregation. We truly seek to be a congregation that lives by your word, that strives to show love, that seeks to know your will, but we confess our inadequacy to do any of these things well, and we humbly beg for your help. Heal our hearts and minds, O God, Help us to grow into loving, forgiving people who radiate your goodness and compassion, giving wiggle room and gracious acceptance to those who are different than ourselves, the way you did, loving Lord, the same way you welcomed people who didn't know you, who were far from you, or who even believed differently than you, you, the one who knew the truth firsthand. I'm so very thankful for your example. When we don't know what to do, we look at what you did and find our most precious roadmap. Thank you for that. How lost we would be had you not come to earth and provided that most perfect example for us. And so it is with greatest thanks for your arrival here on earth and in great anticipation of your triumphant return that we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Good morning. If you ever have a, are asked to do scripture reading, the joy is you get this view, the sun through the stained glass windows, and it's the best view, isn't it, John? I think so. Today's scripture is from Genesis chapter 2, 4 through 17. This is the word of the Lord. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils of the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasant, pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first was Pishon. It winds, it winds through the entire land at Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx were also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put, excuse me, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it, you will certainly die. Thanks be to God. Well, Chris, if you, if you think the view here is good on a worship service, you should see it at a wedding when you get to stand right between the bride and the groom. It's a, truly a blessing. Well, good morning. We are going through Advent, week one, candle one. It comes fast every year, and it also goes fast every year, in case you've forgotten to slow down and enjoy the season. The theme for us this Advent is Emmanuel, God is with us. This is the, the name Matthew gave to Jesus in his account, quoting directly from the book of Isaiah, saying that his name will be called Emmanuel, God is with us. Now, of course, he was known as Jesus. He, no, nobody called him Emmanuel. This was more of a title, an announcement that Jesus' presence is announcing to the world, God is with us. And what I want us to see this Advent this year is that God has always been with us, that there is something unique and special in the arrival of Jesus Christ. But God has been with us from the very beginning. And the first place we saw that, and what some have called the first incarnation, is creation. God is with us. He is with us in creation. The first time God revealed himself to us is through the physical and created world. Now, I'm going to just take a moment to, to talk about the importance of reading scripture in the way that it was intended, reminding us that Genesis 2 is an ancient document written to an ancient people giving ancient answers to ancient questions. This account is not intended to be read as science. As any of the uh, so-called new atheists will be quick to point out to you, in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, the orders of creation are different. That in Genesis 1, we are told that plant life began before the sun was in the sky. And if you know anything about plants and photosynthesis, you know that plants can't thrive and grow and survive without sunlight. And so I want us to, to, 
to say at the beginning, and, and in, in case you want to check my notes, the next three to five minutes of this sermon are from a guy named John Walton, who is an Old Testament professor at Wheaton College. I think he has served, and I think he currently serves as the, the dean of the School of Theology and Biblical Studies over at Wheaton, um, where he really unpacks how do we read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 in light of what the author originally intended to, for us to know. There's science, and then there's poetry and philosophy. And I would submit to you that, well, this isn't controversial at all. Genesis 1 is literally a poem. Uh, Genesis 2 is a account that, that reads like a philosophical account of understanding uh, what it is this, this world is intended to be. Um, so let me just spend a moment talking about the author's intent, because a lot of the sermon that I'm going to give you is going to hang on understanding, receiving from the text what the author wants us to understand and wrestle with. Um, it is not given to us to solve the mystery of human origins. Let me say very clearly, I believe God created the world. Um, I think that is an uncontroversial statement in a space uh, dedicated towards the preaching and proclamation of God's word. God created the world. But when you read Genesis 1, it is not there was nothing and then there was something. It begins with the spirit hovering over the waters and noticing that, there, that the world is disordered and without purpose. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are about God bringing order and through that order, purpose. Now, when I study science, I say to you, science and faith are good friends. And there is, let me just use some uh, legal language here, there's a non-compete clause between science and religion because they are completely different things. It's the, the same way the, the color orange does not compete with the butterfly. Like those are just, they're just different things. Science has its realm and when it stays in its lane, it, it shows us all the ways that God has created a world full of mystery and complexity beyond what we could ever imagine. When I study the human brain, I don't walk away saying, what a marvelous natural evolution through chance. I say, how fearfully and wonderfully made I am. Science tells me how complex the human eye is. It does not, cannot tell me why we moved into a place where life is becoming more and more ordered and more and more complex. Science tells me exactly how complex and beautiful and wonderful the created world is. The Bible, particularly Genesis 1 and 2, tell me why that is, that God brings order, that God moves things in ways that life can flourish, that God puts in us a mission and a purpose, that there is a meaning to our lives. Science cannot answer the question of why and how life is meaningful. It cannot tell me how to live a good life. It can explain to me what happens inside me when I see the wi my wife, but it cannot tell me what love is and why love matters. So I just wanna say if any of you are scientifically minded and been told that f science has some intent to erode your faith and replace the living God, I wanna say to you on behalf of the scientific community that is absolutely false. That is not true, that is a, uh, that's fake news, that science and theology can be really good friends when they stay in their lane. When, when, the, when scripture and when faith answers questions of faith, when science ask, answers questions that are scientific and that we can get along just fine. That the purpose of Genesis 1 and 2 is to invite us to submit to the way that God has ordered the world. Now, fellow Americans, the word submit might stand out to you. And I want to submit that this is the exact opposite of how we view the world. We do not view the world as something that we submit to. We view the world as something to seek control and mastery over. If you have your phone, take it out for a second. I know it's church. I know we put that away. 
may as well make sure it's on silent while you're looking at it. Look at all the apps on your phone and ask yourself, is this app here so that I can learn to submit to the world? Or does this app give me some illusion of control over the world? So begin with any social media you have. Social media is how you control what we know about you. You do not post a picture of a sink full of dishes saying, here's what I'm doing today. You post a picture of your perfect immaculate kitchen ready to receive guests on Thanksgiving. You, post, you don't post a picture of yourself when you wake up saying, check out these dark circles and mangled hair. No, you say, you present to the world and control your image through social media. There's, if you're like me, there's a lot of apps that have to deal with finances, your banking app, your investment app, your app for Chipotle and Starbucks and ways that we push buttons, show up to Starbucks, say hello, they give you a drink that has already been ordered and prepared for, so you don't have to do things like wait in line or tell your order to anybody. All you have to do, and, and I, I'm so frequent at Starbucks that they say, hi, John, and they give me my drink. So I can not say a word to anyone, which is my default setting. It's beautiful, it's lovely. But to say that, that those banking financing apps are about you exercising control. You say, John, what about the weather app? Well, what about your weather app? How many days in advance do you know the weather? And is that so you can submit to it or so you can have some sense of control and not be controlled by pesky things like the weather? We are conditioned to think of the world as something that is ours to claim authority and control over, not something that we have to learn to submit to. Genesis 1 and 2 are about God bringing order and purpose and placing us into that as stewards and maintainers and cultivators of the good world that he made. That we, when we think the world is ours to control, the result of that is a very heavy burden. If you picture the way Atlas is depicted in, in ancient times of this heroic figure with the whole world on his back, carrying it, carrying the weight of the world, that is how I feel most days. That I don't see the world as something that I submit to and receive from, but it's something that I need to control. Uh, and, and I'm reminded of Jesus' words, come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, find your rest in me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That part of what creation tells us is what the purpose of the world is and what our place in it is. Emmanuel, God is with us there in the beginning, with us now, and securing our future. In the beginning God was, now God is, and forever he will be. And in the beginning, he spoke, he created the world. Did you notice what the first three lines of dialogue God has to, to Adam? First words are, you are free. You are free to eat of all the guard that this garden produces. This, this space overflowing with fruit, gold, onyx, aromatic resin, things I couldn't tell you what they are, but they sound really good. Aromatic resin sounds like something that would be wonderful to have around me. That, that what God is saying is, Within this garden, all of it is yours. In the middle of it is the tree of life. That's where you go to receive life from me. And the tree of knowledge and evil. That is the fruit you do not taste. Because I have established the good world for you to enjoy with a reminder that you are not God. Your light burden is to not eat of that tree while you enjoy the rest of the good world that I have made. That we or enjoy the world that God has given us within the limits that he's established and within the purpose that he has given to us. When we choose to control our lives rather than trust God, we will lose meaning and purpose along the way because Genesis 2, 1 and 2 tell us this is how God ordered the world and this is how God established purpose within it. You know, I went to the desert about a month ago. 
Havasu. And I jokingly told a friend of mine that I was going somewhere that matched on the outside how I felt on the inside. Wilderness, I was, I was tired. Tired probably the same way you are tired right now. Um, t- somewhere where my days, my days are very full. I have two full-time, full-time jobs, pastoring and parenting, five children. Those are two full-time jobs. And I learned a few years ago uh, that when I get home from work, which is about a three-minute commute, I sit in the driveway and I, and I center myself, I turn off the engine, and I say to myself, I've left work behind me and now my family's in front of me. Because I found that if I stayed in work mode and walked, worked at home, it, it just didn't go well. I don't, I don't need to bore you with the details of why that was. But that, that I was finding that I didn't have margins and I just even needed a 30 second margin in my car before I walked in the front door to whatever await behind that door with the with a five kids. Um, and what I found is why, what drove me to the desert is realizing I just don't have margins. I don't have spaces in my life to remember and focus on why I do all that I do. I have this strong sense of my life is good, it's beautiful, I love what I do, I love my family, I love all that God has given me in my life, but enjoying it just seemed out of reach. Instead of enjoyment, I experienced fatigue tiredness. I needed to pull away to remember why do I parent and why do I pastor? What is it? What is the purpose behind everything that I do? So I I went for a walk in the wilderness. My friends own a place at Lake Havasu and gave me a key. Said anytime you want to go just let us know. And so I took him up on it after eight years. I finally said okay I'm going to go there and, and I need a retreat. Desert's a great place and you just can't be free. So I was walking around in the wilderness and, and this dry space, reached a couple dead ends, and then I saw this hill that overlooked the water. I thought that would be a good place to stop and pray. And, and as I was walking, I was praying for a sense of gratitude and was finding it and just, just thinking through everything I'm grateful for, just naming them and saying them out loud because there's nobody around me. So I'm thanking God and, and feeling this sense of gratitude for my life and climbed up this hill that overlooked the water. And there's just something absurd about this huge body of water in a wilderness. There's something about the contrast between the dry, the parched, and the water. And I think that's why we go to Havasu, even though it's absurdly hot through the year, 119 degrees, it's, you know, it feels good to jump in the water in the same way. You ever hear that joke about the kid who's hit himself with a hammer? He's like, what are you doing that for? And he says, well, because it feels really good when I stop. That's kind of what Havasu is like. It's like, why do you go there? It's like oppressively hot. Yeah, but it feels good when I jump in the water. It's like, okay, cool, man. Um, So I was wandering around and found this perch overlooking the water, and on top of the perch was a headstone. And there were some flowers around it. There were some lights with a solar panel so that it would be illuminated at night. And the headstone had no name on it. It just read this. If love could have saved you, you would have lived forever. And that cross with a heart on it. No name, no story, no background, no date, nothing. It's just the words, if love could have saved you, you would have lived forever. And I began to think, because this, this is a place that was f- clearly visited. There was some uh, dead, dead flowers there and, and th- some rocks that were ordered. And uh, I thought about who was this person? Who is this community that felt the loss of that? The, 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 what, is it, what did this space mean for them? Why was this a sacred place for them? And, and what is the story? Like what drives people to, to take a heavy slab of cement to, to write on it, if love could have saved you, you would have lived forever, to cross with a heart, and then carried up that hill to place it on top of that overlook with flowers around it? Like what, what is the story behind that? And you know, I don't know. I don't know who they're seeking to honor. But I know the feeling of loss. I know what it's like to lose someone and to want to hold on to that memory and and to cherish it. And I was stirred thinking of, you know, it's these places like this where we sit, we remember, and we think if only when they're alive I'd said these things. Did they know 
how I felt, how much I loved them. That if, if love was what could have kept them and sustained them through this disease, then, then they'd still be alive right now. What, in, in, that, in, the, in that little crisis I was having thinking, that's it right there. If love could, if, tell the people you know that you love them. Cherish it, invest in them. Maintain those relationships. If there's, if there's a fence that's been knocked down, mend that fence, fix it, and, and get back in a right relationship. You know, when, when in this moment thinking, do people, do people I serve know how much I love them? Do you, do you know how much I enjoy and what a privilege it is for me to stand here right now? And what a privilege it is to get to know you as, as a church? It's, it's been an unimaginable blessing for me to, to serve in this capacity and to stand right here. And, and I was sitting there looking at that, grades, that headstone thinking of you, um, which, don't take that out of context, but I was <laughs> thinking, and what specifically what I was thinking was of how grateful I am to be in a relationship with you and to know you, and, and that when, you know, when God made the world, he made the world in such a way that, that when we stop and remember, and when we have margins in our life, that we have this space where we can, we can rediscover again what it is God made us for, what he placed us for. He brought order. He brought meaning to it. And my mini crisis of faith was that I was too busy to see it. The, the noise around me was too deafening to hear it. I was too focused on what was right in front of me to look up and see how good life was. And in this vast desert, there's this huge body of water just calling out to me. And so it was with my life, that watering the desert, this life I have of of going from space to space, there's this whole body of water nourishing right nearby if I can just learn to discover it. For Emmanuel, God is with us. God has made the world. God has ordered it. He's put the water in the desert. Um, and I thought, ultimately, of course, of how love did save us, and we will live forever. That even in there, if our love could save people, they'd live forever. But God's love did save us that we might live forever. That's what the first two chapters of Genesis tell us. We're free. We're free to enjoy this life within the boundaries, within the space, with the, to not eat and not touch the things that God has forbidden, but the emphasis is on the freedom that we have. When our life feels like it doesn't have a purpose, it's usually because our life has no order to it, no margins, no space to be quiet and reflect, no time given specifically to cultivate a spirit of thanksgiving and gratitude. Love has already saved us, and we will live forever. God is with us, and the sooner we can learn that, the sooner we can move to a space where we can live an ordered life that is rich and full of meaning and purpose. God is all around us, revealed to us, shouting to us through his creation, if we can just cultivate ears to ear and eyes to hear, to eyes to see. So may you have some margins, especially this time of year where life is so busy. May you have margins to stop and remember what it is, why we do the things we do, to look around us and say, this Christmas, we have everything we need all around us. It just, the only thing we're missing are the eyes to see it. May we have those eyes to see this Advent season. Let's pray. Father, as we move from Thanksgiving to Christmas, a season that always moves too fast and, and the joy of it always seems just out of reach. May you encourage us through creation that you have created a good world, that you've ordered it, that we might find our meaning and purpose, that we are called to cultivate, to steward, to create, to move from disorder to order, that that's what you've called us to do. So for this Christmas where we are so tempted to live disordered uh, lives, May we pause, may we remember and reflect on you and your goodness to us. May we look around with gratitude for all the good things you've given us, that we might shout to the world, Emmanuel, God is indeed with us. We pray in Christ's name, amen.
receive now your benediction from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. May you have eyes to see it. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no words. They use no speech. No sound is heard from them. But may you have ears to hear it. And may the words of your mouth and the meditations in your heart be pleasing to God. Amen. Enjoy the first weekend of Advent. Thank you.